Okay, um, my name is Nitan. I'm going to talk to you about extreme profiling. Extreme pro profiling is not dangerous. It's something you can do safely if you're pregnant or suffer from high blood pressure. Um, you don't need any sort of protective measures. Perhaps padding your desk when you slam your head into your desk, you might want to have something on it so you don't harm yourself. But other than that, it is perfectly safe. Um, we're going to talk about tools that most developers don't use, so don't feel bad if you've never tried it. The whole point is that when you leave this talk, uh, you might go home and try something new, and in particular, a profiler, not just anything. Um, again, as the picture might suggest, you might want to have bunny ears on when you profile, but you might not. If you work from home, you can do that. Um, thank you all for coming, and thanks to the organizers for setting this up um, and giving us food and drink and the rest of it. Um, I work for Azul Systems. We have the uh, stripper Duke you can see on the upper left there. Uh, we make Zing, which is the uh, most wonderful JVM on earth. It is uh, it's an unbiased professional view. <laughs> only works on Linux, only works on x86, uh, so naturally aimed at server-side systems, not so much for your sort of desktop application um, or running on your laptop. It's, it's geared towards large, beefy machines or, you know, large enough anyway. Um, and we're focused on responsiveness. We're so focused on responsiveness-sensitive systems, so a lot of systems in finance, uh, but also systems in, in sort of commercial websites, etc. Um, we have our own GC algorithm, which is fully concurrent, so the young gen is concurrent, the old gen is concurrent, uh, and typical pauses are sub-millisecond as opposed to many milliseconds in the competing JVMs. And um, we have Ready Now, which is a relatively new feature, but it's, it's quite mature by now, I would say, uh, which allows you to persist profile data from your previous run and use it in the, uh, the new run so that your warm-up period is, is much, much shorter. So all the data that the profiler gathered in the previous run uh, gets loaded up and the compiler can, can do all the compilation at, at startup. Uh, apart from that, I do a bunch of sort of blogging, open source development, etc. Uh, and I organize the uh, Cape Town Java meetup. I live in Cape Town. Right. Which of you guys use JVisualVM or have used JVisualVM in the past? That's, that's good. Anybody here who uses Java Mission Control? Okay, all of you who used Java Visual VM, you should definitely try Java Mission Control if you're running on a post uh, Java 7 JVM. It's, it's a great profiler. And uh, there's other profilers here. This is a, a Rebel Labs uh, survey. And we will be talking about exactly none of these profilers. <laughs> they are entirely, um, when I say extreme profiling, we're, we're going to talk about the 1% that doesn't use any of these tools and encourage you to join them. Um, so what's, what's wrong with these profilers? Why? don't I use them on a day-to-day -day basis, and why maybe you should consider uh, using different profilers on occasion. Uh, for one, there's, there's JVisual VM and similar profilers, and it's, there's a host of profilers here, uh, and I will not name them particularly, who are commercial profilers, and they rely on the JVMTI um, interface to profile the JVM. And that, uh, sadly, means that they're subject to um, sampling only at safe point poles because that's what the API provides, uh, which means they suffer from uh, two main issues. One is each sample, every time they sample, your application stops working, samples, all the threads stop, th it's a stop the world pause, takes a sample, and then you can move on with your life. Um, that's terrible when you think about it. It's profiling your application a, when it's not doing anything, and B, if you have a lot of threads, they all have to stop, they all have to start again. Um, the overheads are quite crippling, which is why a lot of people don't profile in production with these profilers, because they 
can't degrade the performance uh, to that point, which means they, they never see a profile of their application in the production environment, which is itself problematic. Is it raining in here? Okay. All right. Um, each sample they take um, includes all the threads. So you see sleeping threads, you see running threads, etc. Um, and in particular, they suffer, that's the first point, which is perhaps not that clear, is that they suffer from safe point bias, which means they only sample your program at particular points, and there are great many points that don't get sampled, which means your profile uh, may not indicate what you think it indicates. I will not go into that because that's not a problem the profilers we will talk about suffer from. Um, the next level up is Java Mission Control and Honest Profiler, which are sort of one-eyed kings in the land of the blind. They do a much better job, um, and you have to give them credit for that, and really I recommend you try Java Mission Control for that reason. Only limitation um, with Java Mission Control, there's two really. One is you need a uh, slightly sort of recent JVM, and the other one, if you do it in production, you need to pay a license, which involves something along the lines of you know, selling your firstborn. So I can't recommend that, but you know, some people are less attached to their children. Um, they don't suffer from safe point bias, but they only sample the Java stack. So if your application, if you think your application is only about the Java code, then we'll be talking about that in a second. But Notionally, you're running a JVM, it's a process with other stuff happening. Mm -hmm. This is more of nature than I signed up for, but <laughs> yeah, okay. We could be having this talk outside. Um, and not only that, um, they, they're limited in granularity, which perhaps doesn't seem like much of a limitation up front, to the, the line of code. So whichever line of code they perceive as hot, they'll report that. Sometimes that's good enough. Sometimes that's you, you want more granularity than that. And they have their blind spots. Because they rely on uh, an internal API of the JVM called async get call trace. Um, it's not an official API, which is why all the commercial tools don't use them. Only uh, JMC is a proprietary uh, Oracle tool, so it can use that. Honest Profiler just joins for the ride, but uh, it, for instance, it wouldn't work with J9. Uh, up until recently, it wouldn't work with Zing either. So we implemented that API, but it's not an official API. You can be a, an official JVM without implementing it. Uh, that API, however, does suffer from a couple of blind spots. Um, if you're trying to measure when there's a GC going on, or a deopt going on, or uh, some runtime stub is running, your sample will fail. And what you do when your sample fails uh, will vary from one profiler to the next. Uh, we recently updated, uh, I contribute to Honest Profiler, so it was a patch I contributed. Um, so we changed Honest Profiler to, to report those as uh, method frames, so you can see them in your, in your profile. But Java Mission Control, for instance, just drops them on the floor and you never hear about them. So if your application spends a lot of time, for instance, in system array copy, you will never see system array copy in your profile because every time the profiler catches it, it'll fail the sample. Um, similarly, but well, not similarly, this is a different problem, we'll get to it later, but uh, Java Mission Control and Honest Profile and, and most profilers suffer from a problem called SCID. And in particular, SCID and inlining are a bad combination, and we'll get to that in a second. Before we dive in, let's ask ourselves, why do we profile? And I really love this quote. It's not about profiling, but it's about disillusion. Um, and, and on occasion, I've had this conversation with developers where they think they've done something, and they've improved the system immensely, and they've, you know, metaphorically, glued an owl to the Renault Clio, and um, it turns out that that hasn't happened. They were relying on um, a profiler that told them one thing was a problem, and they've eliminated the problem in the profile, but the application was just as fast or slow as it was before. Um, it's sort of, 
you know, on the one hand, when you optimize, you want to optimize a bottleneck. You want to optimize where it matters. You don't want to be the sort of premature optimization victim that optimizes the wrong thing. So you use a profiler to find the bottleneck. But if the profiler gives you the wrong bottleneck, then you're optimizing in the wrong place. So moving right along to profilers that um, care about more than Java profilers care about. Java profilers only cover this area. Um, we want something else, because we want to cover the OS. We want to cover the JVM runtime. So if we're spending all of our time, all the CPU is going to GC, your CPU profiler should admit that. It shouldn't just say, well, I don't know what happened. I couldn't run Java, I can tell you that. But part of that, who knows? Um, the compiler might be running, which is valuable information. Uh, or you might be in some runtime stub or some other runtime activity. Um, and finally, there's your code. But your code doesn't actually run. And what I mean by that, no JVM actually runs Java. Okay, You compile your Java into a class file. You have bytecode. You give that to the JVM. Um, so type erasure happens, for instance. But all sorts of things happen. The, there's a first step of compilation. JVM doesn't run Java. It runs bytecode. The bytecode is run by the interpreter. But if your code is running in the interpreter, that means it's not very important code. It hasn't happened enough times to get compiled. When your code is important, when your code happens all the time, it'll get compiled. Um, so compiled code is the important bits of your application. And then after that, um, we'll be talking about inline compiled code, which is an important sort of it's considered the mother of all optimizations in a way uh, in a compiler, where you take um, methods that you call into and you suck them in to the method that calls into them, and then you can make assumptions about what goes on inside them. Maybe drop half the code in that method you just inlined, or maybe just not uh, load all the members of the class again and again and again, uh, and rather just use them as if they were all in one big method blob. So we're going to be talking about native profilers. Native profilers and JIT runtimes traditionally don't get along. Um, and that's because they had one or all of these uh, three problems. Before we move along, does anybody here use perf? Has anyone here used perf at least once? OK. And on we go. When you go home, try perf. So this is what perf top looks like for a native application. This is Skype on my machine. As you can see, it's doing nothing because it's, it's locking and unlocking, and there's nothing really happening, happening here. But you can see methods. You can see you know, good stuff happening. If, if I knew anything about how Skype works, maybe I, I would be able to offer some insight to the developers about how they could improve it. Right. This is what happens when you do a top on a Java process. Communicating with the sort of addresses um, is hard. And even worse, um, in, in sort of jittered languages, those addresses will stop meaning anything when I restart my application. So the challenge with JIT compiled code is that there are the methods don't exist as far as perf is concerned upfront. They only exist during the runtime, and perf doesn't know about your methods. So what can we do about this? Um, perf, the way perf works, it interrupts your process with a signal. So whatever is on CPU gets halted and runs your, the, the perf signal handler. It collects a uh, PC, which is the, the program counter, which tells it where it is. It's that address in memory that we just saw. Um, and then when it goes on to, to the reporting stage of, of perf, it tries to find out which method are we talking about. And there's, if, if it's a normal application, it would have a static object file. And that would contain the data it needs to, to say which method is at that offset. Uh, if it's JIT compiled, there are no um, SO files. You need to use a map file. Perf has support for JITed languages to have sort of a, a lookup table. 
the JVM doesn't produce that file, so somebody has to. Uh, and that somebody is um, Perf Map Agent. This is uh, an open source project. Uh, Johannes Rudolph, he works. I think, I can't remember what he works on. Interesting guy, anyway, uh, look him up on, on GitHub, looking up on, on Twitter. Um, it produces a perf process ID file, uh, and it's a JVMTI agent. Uh, so in particular, it's, it, it can be attached to a running process. You don't have to add it to all your processes, and then if you forgot, then you can't use it. You can just come along and use it whenever. Um, importantly, it takes a snapshot when you load the agent. And what I mean by that, it's looking at the state of your application um, when you load it and records that in the map file. That is not the reality of the JVM. The reality of the JVM is even more foreign to Perf than uh, usual, because what happens on the JVM is that you compile a method, and then you change your mind, and then you compile it again, and then you would need some sort of notion of uh, mapping over time. And that's simply not supported in Perf as, uh, as it was. And it is getting support uh, going forward. There's an effort from Google to, to support, to provide better support uh, with, with uh, Perf to jitted languages. But we're, we're not going to go into that because it's, it's sort of fairly recent and not everybody has it. OK, so the map file looks like this. It might look horrifying, but um, it actually only has three pieces of information, three columns. There's the address at which we, we will find this method. There's the size of the method in hex. And then there's the name in sort of an, an ugly format, but it's, it's there. So you can sort of scan through this. And if we were sort of masochistic, we would look at perf top, take the address, and manually search through this. But we don't have to, because once we have that file, it works. We can see the, the uh, methods. What we see here is the uh, reality of the process, So, or an interpretation thereof. Um, this is the, uh, the real frames that the JVM uh, is running. And we can also see some interesting uh, kernel methods, like update blocked averages there. Um, we can see all sorts of, of JVM methods happening. Um, so if we had a problem in, in any of these places, it would show up in this profile. So already we're seeing a bit more, a wider picture uh, than we did with a Java profiler. What's nice about Perf is you can use it for a single um, process, but you can use it machine-wide. You can record everything that's happening. Um, so you can get an even wider view, arguably. Sometimes you want that, sometimes you don't. Um, another benefit of you know, suddenly integrating with Perf is that Perf supports profiling um, with hardware counters. It supports um, OS probes. It supports uh, OS events. It supports all sorts of, of new and interesting ways to measure, and you can use them with the rest of the tooling. So I'm not going to touch on, on doing exotic things with Perf, but it's good to know that it has other capabilities. Um, Perf Map Agent supports several levels of granularity for, for its mapping. So you have the default, which is real methods. When I say real methods, I mean the compiled uh, code blobs, which means if you call into hashmap get, and hashmap get was entirely inlined into your method, that hashmap get will not show up in the profile. You won't see it because it's not a real method. It's, it's been inlined. It's no longer on the stack. It's, there's no frame calling into it. It's a, um, inside the JVM, it's referred to as virtual frames. It's an inline method. So you can use unfold simple, which will give you a, a view of inline methods as if they were real methods. And you can use unfold all to give you a, a view of the inline stack. Um, they're both interesting for different things. So when you look at unfold simple, let's say you have a data structure with a small method, and it gets inlined everywhere. That's valuable information. If that method is hot, 
but it's very small. It gets inlined everywhere. You want to know that it's hot. You want to see it as, as one of the top methods in your process. Um, so having it represented as a, a real method is, is important. Um, but um, something you, you can see in the profile here, something a bit funny happens uh, when you do this. Each um, segment of the top level uh, method will get the um, will get represented as its own method, which is only fair because the um, the perf map doesn't allow you to say this method is at this address plus you know five segments. I'm talking about the same method. Here we can see you know uh, hash map put uh, sorry hash map put val in particular as sort of different uh, attributions. Th these are different segments in the same method. Um, so ideally, uh, you, you would sum up all the stats. Sadly, that doesn't happen, but there's, there's tools that do that. Uh, and we'll have a look in a bit. And then you can unfold all. And unfold all does um, this sort of arrow notation. And what that tells you is that you have um, a, the context for the method in, in the place that it was used. So we can see the comparison uh, key over there. Uh, so put val calls into equals. So the the actual method in the Java code that we're looking at is the equals method, but it's the interpretation it got inside put val, which might be different from the interpretation it would get elsewhere. So, so, so what, what is the difference between the first three entries here? Um, there are different segments within the same method. Okay. So. Let's say I have put val and it's inline some methods. Um, then the first segment where nothing is inlined is put val, and then there's some other method, and then it's put val again after that, and then repeats. Um, so it can be slightly confusing. Um, we'll we'll have a look at a tool that makes it all clear in a second. Um, so perf my uh, agent top. Is um, it's one of the scripts that come with PerfMap Agent. Um, when I say when you go home, try it out. This is a really, really simple um, installation. It's you know download from Git, build, and you're good to go. So it's it's pretty sort of uh, newbie friendly. Um, so just go and attach to a process you're running and see what's happening. Attach to Eclipse. Uh, it covers the code, it covers the JVM and the OS. It's, it gives you what perf gives you, essentially. Uh, and for inline methods, uh, you need to remember to enable debug non-safe points. This is it's a flag, it's on, on one of the previous slides. If you don't enable this, the JVM will not generate a lot of debug information between safe points, which will mean the inlining data you will get will be slightly skewed. Um, I don't know of any sort of bad side effect of enabling this flag, apart from the JVM probably consumes slightly more native memory. Um, so I don't see why you shouldn't enable it in, in pretty much everywhere. Um, but you know, it's, um, if, if you don't enable it, you'll see a, a slightly confusing profile. Um, and again, I will mention SCID, but we won't actually go into it right now. Um, Moving right along, um, some men are, are just want to burn things. In particular, this man likes flames. He, uh, this is Brendan Gregg. He's from Netflix, and before Netflix, he worked for Sun and Joyen. He's a brilliant guy. He wrote a ton of books about system performance, and he came up with a really great visualization for code, which is called flame graphs. Uh, and flame graphs when you use them with Java, with PerfMap Agent, look like this. Now, that is really unhelpful. The reason it's really unhelpful is because you can't see any of the Java. The red frames are the native frames. There's lots of those. And then you have the little yellow ones, which are Java. OK, so that's unhelpful. Why doesn't this work? Uh, the reason it doesn't work is because perf can't walk the Java stack. Um, anybody here doesn't an, an, an OS course at university? 
remember anything? Operating systems, funny things, they run on your laptop, etc. Right. If you've done that course, you might remember that there is a stack, and uh, if you remember even more detail, you might remember how the stack works. Um, the JIT compiler doesn't, um, doesn't keep the frame pointer in place. And perf relies on the frame pointer, and the frame pointer points to where um, the frame starts, and from that you can find out where the previous frame is. Um, and because the JIT compiler uses that as an extra register, it gets an extra register, which is a win, but perf doesn't work, so that's a bit of a sad thing. Um, no frame pointer, uh, you get broken stacks, and uh, Brendan Gregg contributed a patch to OpenJDK, and it actually was productized from one of the, uh, by one of the OpenJDK developers, and now it's part of uh, the Oracle JVM. So if you're, using a, uh, if you're using Java 8, you should use the latest update, and if you're using the latest update, this is something you have. Now, here it's more of a sort of gray area whether or not this has uh, a bad side effect. Uh, you can expect to see a performance difference in some areas. Usually it's uh, marginal because what's stopping your JVM from performing is not shortage of registers. Uh, it's all sorts of other issues. On occasion, in if, if you're running code that is uh, very mathematical, very computationally intensive, uh, you might need all the registers you can get, and if this is where your hotspot is, then enabling this option might give you a, a, bit, of a, a bit of degraded performance. So have a good idea of the before and after when, when you try this, but it should be uh, you know, relatively safe. Uh, and when you do that, you get something like this. Slides don't really do justice to flame graphs, so we're going to switch here. And over here, we see a flame graph that I didn't take because um, because I didn't take it. This is a flame graph produced by um, the nightly runs of the Cassandra benchmarks. So they produce their own logs and their own graphs, and they also collect um, this, this flame graph. Um, and the, the nice thing that I, I want to highlight here, first of all, um, you get like a nice tool tip for everything. It's not as bleak as the slide may suggest when you can't click on anything. Uh, we'll click on something in a second. But um, the, the great thing with, with this, um, I was talking to one of the Cassandra maintainers, and he said, I ran this benchmark, and this is what happened, and this is the profile I collected. And he showed me this picture. And you can say a lot just by looking at one picture. It has a lot of data in it. In particular, um, on, on the particular case, it was a bit wider, but even here, you can see these uh, methods, which mean um, he is recording during the warm-up period. And you can just look at one picture and say, hey, this is you, you're recording a profile while you're still compiling. So it's still the sort of, uh, there's a lot of measurement here that is unstable. And if you profile, say, a minute later, the profile will look slightly different. And that might be the reason where that we have some unknown frames here, where perf map agent probably took a snapshot, and the compiler generated a new method later on, and then perf had no idea what we're on about. So couldn't actually tell us what was going on. Um, and we can see all the uh, GC activity. So if you profile an application, Java application, you usually look at the CPU profile. You also separately look at the GC profile. This, you know, if you look at a GC profile, it's really hard to say how much CPU you're spending on GC. Um, you know GC happens. You know when it happens. You can uh, enable extra logging and find out how, mo how long it stopped your application. But saying how much CPU of the overall available CPU was taken by GC is not something that you get, which is important. If you're trying to get maximum throughput out of your machine, you want to use all your CPUs. And if the GC is using, say, 20% of, of your CPUs, then you're missing out. Um, what we don't see here is inline frames. 
So these are all real frames that we're seeing in this diagram. And oh, I wanted to show you. So you can click here, and it zooms in, and you can see more detail. Uh, so you don't have to stay with the like three letters out of a method. Um, and there's an even nicer UI for it uh, that is coming along, which does everything animated and will give you sort of drill into uh, particular threads, profiles, etc. So, where are the inline frames? Uh, Perf walks the real stack. It doesn't walk the imaginary stack that Java has. Uh, so, it only sees real methods. So we're back to the perf top with, with no view of, of all our little <laughs> inline methods. Um, but if you use a perf map agent and unfold all and flame graphs, a read like one of the latest uh, patches, you will have a, a visualization including all the inline frames, which we'll have a look at in at a second. And this is really... Um, to me, because I really like uh, open source, uh, it's it's a great story of collaboration. So you have um, T. Jake, who's one of the Cassandra maintainer, and you have uh, Johannes, the virtual void, and you have Brendan Gregg, and they all worked on different parts all together. And what we got is uh, this wonderful diagram. And again, I'll switch to the browser here, and you can see that the flames burn high. Um, but also we get uh, a new feature here that is actually something you, you don't get with any of the Java profilers, which is a distinction between inline frames and real frames. And that's, to me, very valuable. Um, and I think also to, to all of us it should be quite a, a, an interesting hint. The the part where it gets interesting is where you have a big method that inlines a lot of other methods into it. So I, I just came back from a visit to the Azure HQ, and we have um, we actually have two compiler teams, and um, people who write Java compilers or compilers in general they worry about inlining heuristics. They want to know what normal applications do. And they can have a lot of theory, and it's, it's sort of hard to discuss. But here is a picture of real Java code uh, and its inlining behavior, and what got inlined and what didn't get inlined. Um, on the more sort of developer side of things, methods that, go don't, that are hot and don't get inlined are problems. So if you have a hot method and it's too big, it won't get inlined to another method. Maybe there's something you can do. Maybe you can split it into two methods and that you'll, you'll get some inlining happening there and it'll improve the, your performance. So it is a valuable piece of information if you're trying to improve performance. Um, and you'll notice we can see the Java code calling into native code, which is really nice. Um, we have a bunch of unsafe code somewhere here. Anyway, take it home, play with it. It's going to be great. You're going to love it. Right, so Java Flame Graphs. Uh, it's a great visualization. If you go to Brendan's website, he uses it for uh, shitloads of stuff. He, he uses it for CPU profiling, but he also uses it for off-CPU profiling. He uses, you can use it with any hardware counter that you like, so you can see where all the page faults in your application come from. Uh, or you can see if you have a particular method that suffers from uh, huge numbers of cache misses. Uh, so you can generate this, this new and exciting profile uh, that you couldn't before. You couldn't do it with uh, any of the Java-only tools, certainly. Um, Perf gives you great range, uh, but this only works for um, the, the more, more recent uh, Oracle releases. Um, I'm really sad that it doesn't work with Zing at the moment. Uh, we're getting there. It should happen in, in one of the next releases. Um, but it, it is something that we're, we're actively working towards. Um, if you're on a JVM that doesn't support uh, stack walking, you can still use PerfMap Agent, um, which is better than nothing. Um, and you can generate flame graphs with uh, Honest Profiler or Java Mission Control Profiles. You can also use, um, I think there's one of the scripts for uh, HPerf will, will let you do that. 
um, but then you get into the whole safe point bias, etc. So if you're on a, an older JVM, you can still enjoy flame graphs to a certain extent, but you won't get perf flame graphs. I mentioned inlining. This is from Portal. Uh, the cake is a lie. Really like that. Um, so, like I said, the JVM doesn't run your code. Uh, it runs byte codes, and even then, they get compiled. So, there's no byte code index to speak of. Um, you only have instructions, and when you sample uh, a process, you only get that program counter. But as it turns out, um, there's a funny thing that happens with with uh, program counters. They're not entirely accurate, or not perfectly accurate, or not accurate. Uh, the reason they're not accurate is uh, because when you think about it, um, you may, may have noticed CPUs recently are superscalar CPUs. That means they do more than one operation at a time. So you should have more than one program counter. should have, like, four because more than one instruction can happen. Instructions get translated into microcodes. Microcodes could get fused. There's effectively like a little compiler inside your CPUs without like spending everybody time on it. Compilers are really complicated. Trying to describe what a compiler does with just one instruction is no longer possible. Um, so they do speculative execution as well, which is even more confusing because let's say um, I say um, load this value, and then I branch on that value, and then I do some computation. The CPU is going to guess which value is going to come back from memory, and then it's going to go ahead and do some computation. And maybe eventually it'll hit a point where it has to use the value that it pretended to load. Um, only then will it stop and wait for that load. Up until that point, it's running. So the expense of load is not going to get blamed, because that's not where it stopped. Uh, somewhere down the line, you'll, you'll get all the blame. Different instructions react differently to this situation, and we'll look at a concrete case just now. And you have signal latency as well, uh, depending on the hardware counter, the point at which you try to profile and the point at which you actually profile are slightly apart. Um, this is not a big deal, or you can describe it in tragic terms, but actually people use um, you know, profiles all the time, and they manage to find valuable stuff. Um, it's not a big deal when you're looking at assembly, but we're not looking at assembly. So if you're looking at Java lines of code, um, again, if, if I could say look at the previous line, and that's where all the blame is going to lie, um, would be fine. The problem is, um, we start with this sort of fuzzy definition. We start from program counter, but that's sort of where we are. And then there's not a bytecode index for every instruction. Some instructions are entirely nothing to do with Java, the, the JVM sort of uh, accounting code. So they don't really relate to any line of code. And then you find the closest BCI you can, because you have to blame someone, right? Not every bytecode index have, has a line of code. So you just, you know, again, look for the closest thing. The problem is uh, that that's a very weakly defined thing once you start looking at inlining and reordering profilers. So before the JIT compiler ate your code, uh, it looked something like this. You called all these methods in order, and it all seemed quite reasonable in the code base, and maybe you could make sense of it, right? After it's done with it, uh, some of the methods are gone because the JIT just decided that you're never going to call that. Uh, maybe you're checking on, a, on a something that's provably never going to be true. So the, the JIT compiler is going to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to have that here. So it can reorder different blocks of code. This is particularly true if, if there are no memory barriers in the way of, of that reordering. So it can take a method that was the last method you called and can make it the first method you called. Um, it also does, you know, the, the compiler does interesting things. Like if, <coughs> let's say I'm doing you know, sort of classic defensive programming and I'm checking the arguments in each method you call, and you call three of these in a row. 
when I inline them, it turns out I'm repeating this if statement three times. I don't, I don't need to check that three times. I can check it once. I can load that field once and check what the value is. So the first method will get blamed. And when I say first, whichever one was reordered to be the first. Um, and the other ones won't have to do the work. So which line of code did that if come from? Uh, when, when I was discussing the, the sort of reporting inline methods with uh, guys in the compiler team, they, they, they were sort of, how can you do that? That's not actually how things work. We just jumble it all up. Um, so it's a confusing world after, after you inline. Um, but 60% of the time, it works every time. So uh, it, this, it, it's as good as it gets. You get valuable information. It's fuzzy, but it sort of works. So mostly it's good enough. Sometimes it can be really confusing. And this is a, a convoluted benchmark I came up with. Uh, we have a hobbit that extends atomic long. It is tricksy. We call xadd uh, or inc. xadd just calls uh, get an increment down here. And inc um, not only increments counter, but also calls uh, set add. It's a stupid thing to do, but it does it anyway. Um, when we profile, when, when we start by measuring this code, we can see that inc takes 4.7 nanoseconds, and the x add uh, actually costs a lot more. It costs you know, 6.1. And when we run them together, the inc x add is sort of the sum of those two plus or minus. So performance isn't additive, is one lesson here. But the other message here is inc x add. Uh, if we profiled it, we would expect to see um, the x add method and the get and add long um, as sort of 50% or more of the profile. But when we profile it with Java Mission Control, uh, we see get an increment is like 4%. Uh, 22% is, is spent in hash map put val, and the rest is spent in ink. How can that be, right? Why would that happen? Uh, if we look at the path map agent uh, unfold, uh, we, we also get a confusing uh, profile where get an increment is even less prominent. Why does that happen? It happens because of skid. It happens because we inline methods. And it means the previous line is, is a confusing measure to look at. Because if you look at the call tree, they're nowhere near each other, those lines of code. So how would we actually tell that we have a problem? Um, one option is to use uh, JMH per phasm. Anybody here using JMH? JMH is awesome. If you're doing any micro benchmarking or benchmarking, um, you should be using JMH. It's the official recommended way to do a bad thing. Um, so if you read articles on the web, it's all like, benchmarking is really bad. Don't do it. But if you're going to do it, you should use JMH. Um, so definitely use JMH. Also, I would recommend you benchmark. It's educational. And having concrete measurements is better than having no measurements, in my opinion. Um, JMH supports three perf profilers. Uh, it supports uh, perf stat. So sorry, no, just perf. So you would do minus prof perf. And you would get an output that is similar to the perf stat d. Uh, the nice thing about the integration with uh, JMH is JMH would only measure the measured iterations. So it would drop out all the warm up for you. Um, there's perf norm, which is even nicer because it would take all the stat data, it would normalize it to sort of per operation uh, measurements. That's important because when you compare a bit of code that's going slower than another bit of code, um, comparing the, uh, the stats for them is, is quite confusing. You need to normalize to the work. So if I have you know, 11 million cache misses uh, in one benchmark, and then you know, only 9 million in another, but in the other one, I only did like half the operations, then it's not really a piece of information that I can use. But if I normalize the, the number to the number, of it, uh, the number of operations, then I can say when I run it like this, I have five cache misses per operation. And when I run it like that, 
I have 11. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a better way to look at your profile. Finally, we have perf ASM, which is something we'll have a look at in a second. Uh, if you've used perf, which none of you have, um, it's like perf annotate. Perf annotate uh, annotates your assembly code with the profile and sort of shows you where the hotspots are. So it only shows you that for the hot regions of assembly. So if you, in some sort of sinful point in your past, uh, used to print out all the assembly and try to figure out what the hell was the compiler doing with my code, uh, PerfSM will just dump out the hot regions with their profile and, and you'll have a much more focused view on that. Um, it's sort of a handcrafted, lovingly mixed uh, concoction of print assembly and perf record. Um, and it supports hardware counters, well, just like anything perf. Um, and <coughs> when we run perfasm for this benchmark, we can see that this innocuous move there is where we're spending 45% of the time. Now, moves don't take that long. so. Look one one uh, operation before that, and we see the lock add Q, and this is an expensive instruction, and that's where all the money is. Um, but we can also see that the closest method to the move is the um, get field set that's inlined from um, benchmark increment. So that's why all the blame goes to uh, to the benchmark. If you're using perfasm in Junction with uh, another profile, you'll notice differences in, in um, reporting of inlining and, and which instruction w came from where. Uh, they're all right and they're all wrong, and uh, it's just different views on the same piece of data. So Perfasm uses the print assembly, which is really handy for correlating the assembly with uh, your code. Perfmap agent relies on some JVMTI metadata. Uh, and Java Mission Control and Honest Profiler rely on uh, async at call trace, which uses mysterious internal data structures to get this information. Uh, who's right? Nobody's right. We're sort of running out of time. We'll go a bit quicker. Uh, so Solaris Studio Analyzer is the, first, the last tool on this uh, presentation. Uh, it works on Linux. The name is confusing. It doesn't just work on Solaris. It works on Linux as well. Uh, you can't attach to a running process, but you can launch a process with it. Um, you get mixed profiling, so you get Java and native. Um, in user mode, it has three modes. There's uh, user mode, expert mode, and machine mode. Uh, you get the async get call trace uh, view, and then in machine mode, you can drill into the assembly. Um, so the user mode view of the same benchmark looks very similar to what we saw in Java Mission Control. Um, you know, there's the, the get add long is nowhere to be seen. Um, but if we look at machine mode, then we see that all those methods actually don't exist. They're a figment of our active imagination, and actually what happens is there's only one method on the stack. And inside that method, if we right-click and look at the assembly, we can see the unannotated, shameless uh, assembly for Intel. And in there, we can see the lock at Q. So in here, we get the same view that we would from uh, JMH Perfasm. It's You can't frame everything as a benchmark. So sometimes you would use JMH and then you'll get perfasm. Sometimes you can't do that, so that's another option for you that's sort of easy and usable. Um, working with Studio, first of all, you need to install it, which is sort of a mystery mission because the Oracle documentation on it is a bit lack, but um, you can find instructions online. Uh, you can send up a handy alias, which uh, Shippel have posted once, and I, I use that. It's quite handy. Um, and then you launch it with your alias, you get the collected um, experiment data. Um, importantly, you need to filter out the warm-up data yourself because you have to launch the application with it. So there's going to be a bunch of data in your profile that is not what you want. Uh, and dig in, enjoy, have fun. Um, final words, I have one minute. Exactly. Uh, 
without leaving time for questions. Um, so this is a suggested workflow. First of all, you need to measure at the application level something you care about. Um, well, nobody cares about your profile. You know, you can't call up the business and say, I saved half the instructions, and they'll be like, what the fuck are you on about, right? Um, once you have a measurement that you care about, do some application analysis, server level analysis with flame graphs, uh, identify, draw into your, your bottlenecks. Don't drop into assembly straight away, because it's unpleasant. Um, try and find the problem on the Java level. You know Java, you're comfortable with Java, everybody's more comfortable with Java. Maybe you're doing something evidently stupid on the application level. In most cases, that's, that's what's happening. Uh, next up, try and capture the code, the real frame, not the inline frame, the real frame in a JMH benchmark. Iterate over it, try and make it better, try to improve the, uh, the performance, and when you're done with that, also importantly, re-measure the application. Just because you've improved one bit doesn't mean the application is better. This is especially true for um, multi-threaded applications where the bottleneck might be in a thread that is feeding other threads. So improving the performance of those downstream th threads is going to do absolutely nothing. Um, so they might be really big in the profile, but actually your problem is elsewhere. Um, that's it. I don't have a Q&A slide because I, I forgot to make one. So we're done. Um, any questions? Uh, how does it profile lambdas? How does it profile lambdas? Yes. Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. I haven't looked at that. Lambdas are just, uh, they, they have generated classes, so I would expect the, the sort of lambda classes to show up. Um, but Notionally, the same way lambdas get profiled anywhere. The code has some method, some some class and some method attributed to it. Um, yeah, it's it. Sorry, does it work when the JVM is is uh, stalling or hung? Yes, it does. It's completely. Um, independent of, of JVM mechanisms. Sorry, we're sort of uh, over time. So um, come to me with any questions. Thank you very much for coming.